The Lord bless you, brothers and sisters. Thank you so much and welcome to Bible study another Wednesday evening. So very to happy to have all of us who are joined. And as usual, it is a great delight to share with us Amen in our regular Bible study series. We have been in the book of Genesis. We have, for the last couple of weeks, probably months now, you know, I've been going through bit by bit, and we thank God we have come to a point where we want to you know, bring it to its close. Uh, to do that, we certainly will be going through, doing a bit of review, and touching on probably one additional uh, episode that I believe is uh, significant and has a lot to say about things that have happened and things that are to come. Uh, we have seen, brothers and sisters, that the book of Genesis speaks to so much. It has so much rich, rich history and it is prophetic. So it gives us a background of the things that has happened. If we did not have the book of Genesis, then a lot of the things that we know now and that we preach and that we teach and that forms a part of the things that we portray and that we push out to all, if we did not have the book of Genesis, we would certainly not have the benefit of understanding how things that we see today, how things that we experience today, how they actually came about. But God, who is a good God, uh, saw it fit for us to understand some things. And even with that, there are some things that we still will never understand until later on when God chooses to reveal it to us in the by and by. We folks have asked us, and anybody that seek to try to tell you that this is where God came from and this is how God came about, uh, will be doing a disservice because the Bible at no time declared or outlined give us any synopsis as to how God came about and how did he become God. If everything has a beginning, indeed God should have a beginning, but then he has none. And a lot of things as it relates to that we will never understand. And so we're not going to try to um, give the impression that we know it all. None of us know it all. And for now, we don't know anything about where he originates or anything like that. What the Bible declared to us in the book of Genesis uh, is that in the beginning, God, he told us everything as to how it started. You know, he gives an idea of what happened and he rolled it out over a period of days and he told us what happened each day. Day one, day two, day three, going down. And he gives the beginning of all things. However, he chose not to tell us anything about himself. And this is how God is. And if this is what he chose to tell us, then this is what we must direct our studies around and so forth. So we have been in the book and we are going to take some time and just do a quick revision later on so that we can refresh our minds as we seek this afternoon to move to close our look, our study, our examination on the book of Genesis. All right? When we started, uh, when we started, we gave ourselves, I believe it was about four objectives. And I want to look at those objectives uh, this evening so that we can see and we can be clear in our minds because if the objectives are clear we can see if in fact having gone through the things that we went through 
if we did in fact achieve our objectives. And so I want to direct our attention, amen, to the uh, screen so that we can take a look at the four objectives that we started out with, all right? And so <clears throat> we are going to take our time and we are going to just look at the objectives. I will segue a little from it after a while because I want to take us to one of the uh, very important episodes in the book of Genesis uh, so that we can make a point and we can again examine because a lot of the things that are there in the book of Genesis, though they were literal stories, though they were real events, we have seen where they had meaning of significance for things that were way down the line to come. And so this is why I'm saying to us, and we have said it in the past, that this book of Genesis is very significant. If we understand, if we appreciate, if we accept, if we believe that what is written in the book of Genesis is real, it is factual, this is the word of God, then we are able to stand securely as we seek to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ and everything else that we do in this day and age as children of the Most High God. If we are wobbly in our belief system as it relates to what transpired in the book of Genesis, then we are going to have a problem as we seek to try to defend this most holy faith that we are a part of. And every single one of us is going to be called upon to defend this faith. Every one of us is going to be called upon at some point to stand in defense of what you believe. And it is for this reason why the, the, the greatest onslaught, the greatest efforts are being made by folks with nefarious intentions. The greatest efforts are being made by people with ulterior motives, the efforts to discredit the book of Genesis. This is why you have atheists talking about evolution. This is why you have folks hammering at the book saying you're talking about thousands of years when in fact science is saying millions or billions of years. And therefore Genesis cannot be a correct account because it is woefully lacking in terms of scientific and other technical infrastructural support. It cannot stand the test of science. But we are not here to defend science. We are not even here to defend the word of God more than we are here to declare the word of God and defend our faith. God can defend his own words. You know, God can defend himself. But the truth is, the things that are there in the book that are outlined in Genesis, which represents the foundation of everything else, it will come under attack. It has come under attack. It will always be under attack. And the reason why we have embarked on the study of the book of Genesis is so that we can understand what is there in our own minds, be clear of the theme of the book and that the things that are there are true and that they are from God and that Genesis is in fact the word of God. The book is a part of the Holy Scriptures and that being the case, it will help us to build our faith as people of God today and so propel us to continue in this faith that we are a part of. Take time out brothers and sisters, go back over the notes, go back over the lessons, have it re, well, riveted in our minds firstly and just take our time and somehow have it constantly flowing through our system to the extent and to the point where the book of Genesis is etched 
in a certain part of our heart is indelibly imprinted in our minds so that we are clear that this is the word of God. The things that are there are true. It doesn't matter what the scientists or anybody say. The word of God is true. And if he said that he did the heavens and the earth in six days, then he did the heavens and the earth in six days. Yes? And if he said he rested on the seventh day, then he rested on the seventh day. It is Bible. It is word. Now, some, sometimes folks try to, because they want the word in Genesis, to fit into the scientific mold because they want somehow to show that they have relevance and that we are not just weird people totally opposed to uh, scientific norms and scientific principles because this is what governs you know education in the 21st century if you seem to be diverging from a certain educational path, people tend to look at you as being weird and you're, you're illiterate or you're, you're just unenlightened. And so many of us are scared at that. And even within the ministerial circles, there are those that would feel somehow belittled because you rest everything upon the Bible which is the declared word of God. And because it somehow it is inconsistent with what is put forward by science, we believe that we are going to be seen as uneducated or unlearned or unenlightened and things like that. No, none of us need to be on our back foot. Not one of us. We need to stand resolute in what we believe. And Genesis is a part of the Holy Writ and we must stand up for it. We must speak about the book. We must speak about the things that are written in the book with all the surety that the things that are there are true, are real, are consistent. They come from God. God revealed to Moses all those things and he wrote as the Spirit of God moved upon him and allowed him, enlightened him, so that he could understand what happened, what transpired, and he wrote it so that today we will know. So don't feel any way. Don't feel that you're uh, cutting yourself short and you're not a part of the fit of the 21st century because you believe the Bible and believe that God created the heaven. The, the, the people of today would give the impression that the things that are in the Bible are elementary. They are fairy tales. And so the Bible tells us a story, they call it. And the word story has been defined today in such terms that presents it as a fairy tale. If you look at a modern definition of story, it has somewhere in it a fairy tale, as if you're relating something that is not real, but you can use that fairy tale to make certain inferences and to make points about certain things. So a, a modern day definition of story gives the impression that it is a fairy tale. So when we talk about Bible stories, you know, those in certain circles will say, all right, so you want to know about some story, some fairy tale, read the Bible. But if you want to know real stuff, reality, and how this world came about, then here are some books written by X, Y, and Z authors that will give you scientific, factual details. And therefore, they present the Bible as fairy tale. But if you want read, real, scientific, rationalizing information as to how he came about here it is in a book written by professor so and so that is how they are presenting the bible today but it doesn't matter how they present it i want you i want the members of the body of christ to know and to understand that it does not matter how men try to skew it to present it to put it in any way genesis the book of beginnings is where it all started the book was inspired by God. The writer, it is believed, is 
Moses, none other than Moses, and the contents of the book are true and they are real. And where is a God did believe it, saints of the Most High God? God did. So let us look at the screen just now so that we can together have a quick review of what we had as the, the objectives for the study that we have done over the last couple of weeks or months, whatever. There were four major objectives. Objective number one, to survey the book of Genesis and to get a clear breakdown of the important themes in the book. So we want it to be clear in terms of the breakdown of the book. We wanted to see what the different themes were that were in the book. And I believe we had gone through where that was concerned. We'll review that so that we can be clear that we are consistent in ensuring that we would have met that particular objective. Objective number two, by going through the book of Genesis, we wanted to ensure that it built our faith in the authenticity of the book. Because the book is constantly, brothers and sisters, under attack. The book from every angle, the atheists, the, the people of science, just about every secular person, every individual that Satan can get his hands on, that he can use to try to throw a spanner in the authenticity or the validity of the book of Genesis, he literally is doing that. But for the saints of God, we went through and we showed some things and we, again, I said, we will quickly do a review because we want to make sure that as we come out of the book of Genesis this evening, we are clear again in our mind the things would have been reinforced the things would have been properly etched and settled in our minds and it is our desire and therefore objective to build our faith in the validity in the certainty in the authenticity of the book itself and i believe based on what we have gone through we should be leaving with our faith much stronger in the book of Genesis, and of course, beyond that, in the book of the Bible. Because if Genesis is right, then I can absolutely assure us the rest of the Bible is also right. Okay, then objective number three was to outline important, an important purpose for the book of Genesis. And we have said that Genesis spoke to us about things that were happening there. But as early as the book of Genesis was, and as much as God placed Adam and Eve in the garden early in the book of Genesis, you will realize that it wasn't long before Adam and Eve sinned and what God intended. The whole plan was broken down simply because man made a decision and he went the wrong way. But immediately as the sin occurred and man fell, we realized that right away a plan was there, a plan set by Almighty God to restore, to redeem, and to bring back man ultimately to that place where he was going to continue now to fulfill his initial plan of having man being in paradise and he, God, communing with man in a particular way. So we see that, yes, Genesis was the book of beginnings and it outlined creation from the very beginning. It gives us the whole episode of creation. But similarly and almost simultaneously, it gave us a picture of redemption. So the purpose of the book of Genesis, which spoke about creation, it actually at the same time spoke about redemption. So yes, it started with the creation in a perfect state, and yet then 
uh, the fall from grace, fall from the presence of God, but then redemption, salvation was right there in the book of Genesis. And it showed that the purpose now was to show that God had a plan that although we fell, he was going to lift us up and we were ultimately going to go back to that particular end where God's will on earth will be done as it is in heaven. So yes, Genesis gave us a good overview of the creation, but it also gave us a good overview of salvation and redemption and pointed us to a day that was coming when everything was going to go back to what God originally intended for it. And we see all of this creation and redemption happening in the book of Genesis. So the purpose is clear and as crystal. And then objective number four, we see where uh, we wanted to answer some crucial questions that would naturally arise as a result of studying the book. It was as we went through the book and started to analyze what men in their different capacities had to say about the book as they tried to discredit it. You recall that we had gone into discussions uh, about dinosaurs. We had gone into discussions uh, about these large beasts, these large animals, because it was believed by many that the Bible did not speak about them, and yet we are seeing their fossils all around us um, today. And to the extent that you have fossils, and fossils are the bone structures and so forth of these mammoth beasts that somehow they say the Bible did not speak about. The fact that you had these fossils around, then folks are saying that, hey, the Bible we probably might not be able to take the Bible um, straight off because here it is that these things we are not seeing. The Bible never mentioned them. The scientists have mentioned them and we are finding their remains in terms of the fossils, their bones and the structures and all of those things today. But we made the point as we started to answer questions about the dinosaurs and we answered questions about Noah and Noah's Ark and we answered questions about a number of different things that would naturally arise. We see where the Bible was always put on because it speaks to these very beasts that people think the Bible made no mention of. It spoke of these large beasts. It spoke about one in particular that the tail of it was like the, the trees out in Lebanon. Just the tail alone that this particular beast, as if he would drink off all the water out of the river and drink the river dry. It spoke of some things that as we start to look at the scriptures and examine, the very things that we thought were not there were in fact there and were uh, presented in the very word of God. And so I want us to understand that as crucial as the questions were, we looked at them and we spoke to dinosaurs and we spoke to those what was called dragons and those beasts that somehow spewed fire out of their mouth right in the Bible and we presented them to all of us. We looked at the race and where we came from and we saw in the book of Acts and other books that we looked at and we saw where the Bible said that we all came from one common race and it is from that race that all the nationalities that we now know, the different tribes, the different ethnic groups that we now know, they all broke off and broke out and went into the different areas but we all originated from common ancestry. I think the last time that we met and we look at that in study, we saw where um, even the scientists have come to the conclusion based on evidence in our genome and other things that we had a common or had common ancestry. And scientists are just finding out these things in the 20th and 21st century, but we have presented to you things that were already in the book for 
hundreds and hundreds of years in the book that we call the Bible. And it made it clear to us that we were from a common ancestor and we couldn't make it any clearer. And now we are seeing that, that is the situation with scientists and science is now consistent with what we presented to us. So we don't use the science to validate what is in the word of God. Because even if the science says it is wrong and try to give proof, I can absolutely guarantee any one of us that it's only a matter of time. Because science always is changing. Things are being upgraded. Things that they thought were facts before have changed and is no longer facts. It was said by some doctors years ago that an apple a day keeps the doctor away, but then they're now finding out that apple have some amount of sweet that it can cause harm more than, than, than it causes good. And so whereas in the past the doctor said apple a day is good for you, it changed now. They say a banana a day will keep the doctor away because the, the banana has potassium and I'm showing you how much we need potassium even more than other fruits. And yet for some people, if you ever eat one banana, you're in trouble because of the amount of sugar that it has. So we find that you can't even take the word of these in the medical field that have done scientific work to try to tell you what food to eat. They tell you that this is good today. Egg is good for you. It, it, it causes for men, it builds their testosterone. Most men didn't even know that. And yet this, another set of doctors tell you, as if you eat one egg every day, your cholesterol is going to reach to a point where it's just a little while before you die of high cholesterol. You don't know what even to eat if you listen to these people that do science and scientific research and all of those kind of things. It changes every day. But the word of God, it says we were from one common ancestry. 20 years from now, you're not going to see that oh, oh, third edition Bible is now upgraded. It's no longer that, but it is this. That will never happen. You might get a new print Bible with commentaries in it, but the word, that thing which represented the word of God, it will never change because our God changeth not. And so in terms of objectives, brothers and sisters, I believe having stated these objectives, as we do our review, then we can match it against the objective to see if we did in fact uh, meet our objectives. I believe we did, but we will take our time and we will go through, do a quick review and make sure that the objectives were met. And that is very important. But I can safely say to all the saints of God that the book of Genesis, you can stand on that book and you can be fully assured that everything that is in the book every name they are real names every episode they are real events the things that were there that spoke about creation and on the first day and on the second day and we will review them because i just wanted to be clear in our minds to keep the thing alive they were in fact so and I guarantee you, saints of God, if we are clear in our minds, if the things are there and we accept them as they are, we are standing on good ground. We are standing on solid ground and all will be well. So I want our systems to be permeated or I want the word and this understanding to permeate our system and to permeate our minds. I want this to be imprinted indelibly in our minds. I want us to accept it. I want us to believe it. And I want us to stand firm in the word that Genesis is true and it is real. And no man must shake your faith for no Young lady, no young man, no child of God anywhere must be wavering and wandering and your knees knocking when you start to see scientific information coming to discredit the Bible and to discredit Genesis and to discredit even the very existence of God. Run them away and hold on to these fundamental truths 
that have emerged over these couple of weeks. Now, before I continue into the revision as we seek to close, I want to introduce another episode, another thing that highlights, that jumps out at us in the book of Genesis. And I said there are so much, and we can't just look at them. We, have, we started, I think we have done an, a, a nice little overview, and I've spent some time looking to some areas, and so we will certainly bring it to a close and move on. But I really wanted us to pull out from Genesis a particular episode with a particular person because, again, uh, it tells a story. Again, it points to something that is to come. And it is important that we understand, that we see these things and understand what they mean. For many of us, our salvation just captures where we are now and what we are doing as we walk with God and as we, as we look for his coming uh, any time now. And our salvation and our experiences revolve around a very small radius. It, it is really small. But I would like us to understand, saints of God, this thing that you are in, this holy faith, we need to understand and have a full perspective of how deep it is, how wide it is, and how important it is. I want to use this to remind those of us that are a part of the body of Jesus Christ, that have received this most holy faith. I want us to understand that what we have is powerful, and we must not treat it lightly. I want us as children of the Most High God to recognize, and even if we feel like ordinary people, because we are people, but we are not ordinary people. I want us to know that we are a part of a movement that was in the mind of God and that was spoken about from in the book of Genesis. I am going to ask us very shortly, to read from the book of Hebrews chapter 7. We're going to put it on the screen. So we're going to segue a little bit from the screen, the PowerPoint, in terms of what we just looked at, the objectives, and we have some things to show us as a part of the review in terms of, you know, what we did already and bringing it alive again as we seek to close off our study on Genesis. But before we go there, I'm going to segue a little bit because I want to bring to our attention a certain individual and what he represents. And I want us to know that what we are in today, the church of the living God, it might seem because of how many of us treat it, like it, it is as if we are in just another thing, another organization, another group of people. It is just another social group, brothers and sisters. It is not. We are not in an ordinary thing. We are not in an organization, so to speak. Organizations are only set up to try to administrate the work because there's so much to be done. But we are in something much deeper. And if we don't know what we are in, we are going to take what we are in as just any ordinary little thing. It is not. God chose to reveal some things in Genesis. And whatever is revealed in there, it is what God chose to put in there. Now, remember, the book of Genesis runs a period, just between Genesis 1 and Genesis 50, is about 2,500 years. You know what 2,500 years represent in terms of time, in terms of things that happened, in terms of events? Books today could not contain what easily could have happened amongst people over a 2,500 year period. So much volumes of books could have been written. And yet, in 50 chapters, God allowed what happened over a period of 2,500 years 
to be contained. So that one little book that we have called the Bible, you just take one chapter out of 66. And that one book, uh, sorry, one book out of 66. And that one book, Genesis, contains 2,500 years worth of events, experiences, and all. It means that with all the things that would have been happening, God allowed only what we see in Genesis to be put there. It is significant. And one of the things that we saw, which I'm going to bring to our attention, is the emergence of a man. His name was Melchizedek. In fact, before we turn to Hebrews chapter 7, starting from verse 1, let us take it from Genesis. Genesis chapter 14. And I'm going to have us to read Genesis 14 verses 18 and 19 in a short while. But I want us to remember and to recall that Abraham had come to a particular place. And when he went out to take care of some business, some kings from other places came by and plundered his dwelling, took away the woman, took away his nephew Lot, took away the cattle and all those things because Abraham was a man of means. And these kings came and plundered the place and they went away so that upon Abraham's return and seeing all that had happened, I mean, easily anybody would have broken down and in despair just go one side. But Abraham did something that it caused us to realize and to recognize the, the nature and the strength and the character of the man. Because he gathered up the few men that he had with him. Just a few. And they pursued these large groups of people that came and plundered his place. And he went and he caught up with them. And he slaughtered them. Now it sounded crazy because I think it might have been Abraham with about less than about 18 men. Few. And they left to go after a marauding army. Group of men from different places. And it says kings from certain places. So you know that these are men that ran countries, ran groups of people and had their fighters with them and Abraham with a few men went after them so we would easily think that Abraham was crazy but Abraham was a man that trusted God that believed God and so even though the scriptures did not say it there and then it had to be is faith and confidence in God that allowed him to get up with these few men and pursue his enemies because they had to be enemies. But he got up and he did pursue them and he caught up with them. And brothers and sisters, he took them on, head on. He fought with them and he destroyed them, decimated them, and took back his family, and took back the cattle and all that they are taking from them, and got back his nephew Lot, and returned, going back to his place over there in Canaan. This is Bible. It sounds strange and it sounds far-fetched because there's one man with a few untrained men that are untrained in warfare. But they had, somehow, Abraham got up and went after them. It had to be God. Even though, as I said earlier, the scriptures did not declare that at the time. But on his way back, 
something tremendous happened. And this, this has somehow caused folks to wonder how could this be? What is the meaning of this? Was this God that met him along the way? Was, what, what happened? And the Bible tells us in Genesis 14, it, it gives us a very small synopsis of an event that was a real event, a powerful event, but an event that had a lot of significance and symbolism. And we are still in the book of Genesis. And so this episode in Genesis reverberated throughout the ages because way down in the book of Psalm, David spoke about the man that was in this particular experience. Then beyond David, into the New Testament, into the church age, the age that you and I are a part of, the Apostle Paul makes mention about this man that was figuring prominently in this episode. In fact, Abraham, who is the father of the faithful and the father of the Jewish race, the father of faith, when he met upon this particular individual, he bowed before him and paid tithes to him. What? This is even before the concept of tithing was made mention of in, Je in Exodus. Let us look and see if we can just extract from this. So we're still in Genesis, and although we're going to close off this evening, we, we had to pull another, you know, so much to pull. So we are pulling, and we are talking about now this person called Melchizedek. Who was he? What was his purpose? He was a priest, the Bible said, after the most, or a priest of the most high God. But high priests, priests and high priests and the system of the Levitical priesthood never even existed as yet. Levi was not even born. And yet the Bible in Genesis is talking about a high priest. Outside of this, high priests and priests only came in the book of Exodus after the birth of Moses, after they grew and when God was setting up the tabernacle and the, all of those things and establishing who was going to be priest and establish Aaron as the first of the high priests. So here was Aaron and he was now going to set the priestly line and the priesthood in order. And so it started there. But that's Exodus. But here in Genesis, Abraham, who was the father of the Jewish family, as yet he didn't even have a son. So that the priesthood that was to come, it couldn't happen yet because the first son didn't, wasn't even born. And yet still a high priest existed. How could this be? And so we're seeing where God is showing us something. Let us turn to the book of Genesis chapter number 14, brothers and sisters. And we're going to read verses 18 and 19 together. And we're going to take a look at this man called Melchizedek. Praise God. So, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And we're going, I want to tell you, let us read a little further because um, you would be surprised to see that God is that God is talking. All right, without even going any further then, brothers and sisters, the point that I wanted to make is this. 
God was the one. It, God was the one that actually allowed for Abraham to have the victory over. Listen to what it says in verse 20 here. We'll, we'll read some more. We'll read going down. And blessed be the most high God which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. So brothers and sisters, we are seeing here from this man that Abraham met when he was coming back from the slaughter. He saw this man and the man introduced himself and he brought him bread and wine and they started to talk. And Abraham literally bowed before the man. And the man was now telling him that blessed be the most high God which had delivered thine enemies into. So the man was actually literally now telling Abraham how and by what means he was able to overcome those enemies. Remember now, you know, it was a marauding group of men. And they came with their trained mercenaries, their trained soldiers and ransacked the place and took away and plundered and carried away the woman and carried away Lot and everything that pertained to Abraham. And Abraham only got up with a few men. So it seems a crazy thing. And folks looked at it and said, this is just crazy. How can one simple man with a few untrained men take on an army of folks? And yet, and the same way the Bible said, him destroy them. And take back everything and was on his way back home. That does not make that sound like fairy tale. Brothers and sisters, it sounds like fairy tale. It's just that in the earlier part, it did not disclose. And we have got to understand the saints of God. A lot of times we read things in scripture and it don't even mention God. It don't even mention that God intervened. It just gives the story and they just seem to have a victory and just get up and move on and turn back and go, go back home. So sometimes we read particular scriptures, but it wanted to highlight a particular incident and not anything else. We reading into it say, but how could this incident be? It just don't seem to make sense. But for whatever reason, God wanted to highlight the incident. We must understand that a lot of things that happen in life, we might not realize it. We might not want to recognize it, but it had to be the hand of God that made it happen. And so we must be aware when we are dealing with things, even in our lives today, and we see ourselves coming through something, things sometimes, and we say, boy, thank God this thing seemed to just happen. I don't know how it happened, but it just turned up. Boy, what a coincidence. Brothers and sisters, it is not a coincidence. Many times the thing happened without our knowledge as to how it came about, but it is the hand of God. It is He that many times made it happen. It is He that delivered the enemies into your hands, and you don't even know it because He chose not to reveal it. Well, this was a particular case in the situation with Abraham when he was, it see, when he was coming back. It seemed an impossible task, an impossible undertaking. But the man get up and move by faith and he moved with alacrity and he ran after the enemies and he caught up with them and he totally dismissed them. The small group that was there with Abraham. And on his way back, it is this man that he met that was called Melchizedek that actually told him, and we're seeing it in verse 20, of Genesis chapter 14 and blessed be the most high God which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand so he was now telling him how he came about being victorious against that group he was saying it is the most high that did it for you and you know what happened the Bible said he gave him tithes of all so we are seeing a couple of things happening now, saints of God. We are seeing a couple of things happening now, saints of God. One, we are seeing 
a high priest at a time when there was no tabernacle established. We are seeing a high priest at a time when there was no priestly lineage because the priests came out of the 12 tribes of Israel. You had a priestly tribe, which was the tribe of Levi. You had a royal tribe, which was the tribe of Judah. And all these were coming out of the bowels of Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. And so they are called the 12 tribes of Israel. Levi being the priestly tribe, Judah being the royal tribe, out of which Messiah the prince would come. Yet, Jacob was never yet born. And therefore, the 12 tribes, which are the 12 sons of Jacob, was non-existent. So there was no priestly tribe out of which the high priest would come. And yet we are seeing in Genesis, at a time when Abraham was there, that Abraham was speaking to the priests of the Most High God, Melchizedek. And there was no tabernacle, there were no sacrifices, there was no priestly lineage, there was no priestly tribe, and yet Melchizedek was there. But hold on. We are now seeing that Abraham, without being asked, without being told anything, started to pay tithes, a tithe of all that he had. He gave it over to Melchizedek. So a couple of things start to come to our minds now. Who is this Melchizedek? And we have a right to ask that question because he's here considered a high priest of the Most High God. But in the same breath, Abraham is now paying tithes, giving tithes to this high priest whom he just met and who he bowed before. A lot of things come to mind now. Is it that God is down here in the form of a theophany because Abraham bowed to the man he paid tithe the man was a high priest at a time when high priest wasn't around how so? who is Melchizedek? what does he represent? let us see a little bit more about this man let us read together from the book of Hebrews brothers and sisters Hebrews chapter number 7 and we can take probably from verse 1 to about verse 3. Let us read and see a little bit about Melchizedek and see what the Bible says about him. Let's read together. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1 to 3. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem. Now, Salem is the shortened version of Jerusalem. And this man was the king of Jerusalem. Remember, at this point, Jerusalem wasn't even in the hands yet of the children of Israel. They weren't even born yet. Jerusalem was to be their capital city, the city of the great king. And Jerusalem was not around as yet. And this man was the king of Salem, king of peace, and then prince of the most high God. And hear what Paul is writing and saying, Who met Abraham, which is what we just said, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and he blessed Abraham, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. That's what we just read a while ago. What we said in Genesis 14, Abraham paid him tithes. So Abraham now gave him a tenth part of all, a tithe. Abraham now gave tithe to this man. First, being by interpretation, king of righteousness. And after that, also king of Salem, which is king of peace. So this man that Abraham met, he was the king of righteousness. Because a part of his name represents that. And he was the king of of Salem, which is a shortening for Jerusalem, and so he was the king of peace. 
And he just seemed to be this mysterious feather, um, figure. Because verse 3 now, verse 3 now, start to give us something about this man. Without father, because nobody never knew who his father was. Or without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days, nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abided a priest continually. Now he's talking about Melchizedek, you know. So brothers and sisters, this Melchizedek is a figure that is hard to try to pinpoint who exactly he is. Because he was literally a man. Now it couldn't be that this was a theophany of God. Because let me tell us how God operates. Let me tell us how God works when it comes to theophany. He would come down. He would come down. And take on human form for short periods to accomplish certain things. So, for example, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were in the fiery furnace. And while they were thrown in there and were expected immediately to die, the king looked and saw them walking up and down. And of course, a fourth man was in there. And the fourth was like unto the Son of God. And so, no doubt, this was a theophany. This is God coming in the form of flesh. Of course, it could have also been an angel that he sent. But many times, there is a difference between the angel and the theophany. Because you recall at one particular point, Abraham was out and he was doing some things and he got a visitation. And he knew that these were special people. But there was amongst the visitors one that when he saw the man fell down and worship him and he realized that he was visited by God. The scripture literally outlined that he knew it and he realized that he saw God and others, other visitation of God when he came like that. It's afterwards sometimes these men recognized that this was God himself and so it had to be that God came as a man. It's just that it was not through the virgin birth. So he came and then he departed. And so we have instances in the Old Testament where God himself came down in the form of a man. Jesus was not the first time that God came to earth in the form of a man. He came as man before, but not via the virgin birth, not via a human conception and then delivery. So however else he did it, he came into the natural realm, the material realm, and he stood up, but usually for short periods, do something, and you just see him evaporate. This, this man that Abraham saw at one point when he went out and he went to offer up sacrifice, and said, look, I'm going to offer up a sacrifice, because, oh God, he realized that he's, he's seeing God in as much as it is in the flesh, but face to face. And while he offered up the sacrifice, this man came over and just got consumed with the sacrifice and just vanished. So in many instances, God would have come himself. And that theophany, that form of man was God in that form. But we're not sure what to make out of this Melchizedek guy. Because there are some that argue that it had to be God. Because here in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 3, it declares that he was without father, without mother, um, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. And so it's just, but we have to be careful how we read into it and read the scriptures. Because when it says without father, without mother, without descent, it might simply mean and in some translation, it is written that way. They can't ascertain who his mother was. They can't determine who his father was. They don't have any genealogical record of him. Because remember this now, and we, we, we're stepping into some things now, you know, so follow me now, saints. Remember this now. The Jews have a strong history of record keeping. So Abraham begot Isaac. 
Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Reuben and the 11 others. And then it goes on to say, Reuben begot whoever, and it gives you all the breakdown of the others coming down the line. So that there is a, a strong record in terms of the ancestry of the Jews as they came down the line. But that record started in earnest after Abraham begot Isaac and Isaac begot Jacob and they started to record it coming down. But here was Abraham who was the father of all of those. So it started, the book started here so. But Abraham now come meet upon this man. So long before genealogical records came into being, here was this guy that met Abraham and Abraham who was supposed to be the father of all and the greatest in terms of mankind meet up on another man let him drop on him knee and bow before him and pay the man tithes and recognize him as the high priest of the most high God who was serving the same God that Abraham was serving now remember this innocence Abraham was told to leave his father's house in Ur of the Chaldees they were idol worshippers. Now, if all of Abraham's family were idol worshippers, how is it that Abraham knew this God in heaven? A lot of people think that God just revealed himself to him. No. Of course, he didn't know, but that is not how he knew. He learned about him. Now, many of us wonder, then who did he learn about him from? Because if his father was an idolater. All of his, and this is why God said, leave that house. He recognized, so God had his plan, you know. And he said, leave father, mother, everybody, because a house of idol worship, all the people around were idol worshippers. But where then did Abraham, <clears throat> when he was a child, how did he not become a part of the idolatry and the idol worshipping and so forth? There's a book that tells us exactly what happened to Abraham and where he spent a lot of his time. Brothers and sisters, did you know that when Abraham was born? By that time, Noah would have been an old man, probably wouldn't have died yet because Noah lived a couple of hundred years. And Noah had... Shem and Ham and Japheth. And then Shem had a couple of sons. And coming down the line, about the grandson, our great-grandson, was Abraham. Now, most folks don't realize that when Abraham was born, Seth, Shem, was still alive. And Shem's dad which is Noah, was still alive. Most folks don't understand that because it is not outlined in the Bible because the Bible is not showing us that history. The Bible tells us everything that we want. But there are other books that even the Jews themselves read and revered. It might not be in the 66 books that we call the Bible, but there are other books that are spiritual books that the Jewish people and those who know God read and revered, and we can pull things from them. So we have a preacher that comes on on TV today and tells us about the book of Enoch. And you are being robbed because you don't read the book of Enoch. It should be in the Bible. Well, if it should be in the Bible, why not there? So what is in the Bible is in the Bible, and God has given us what we should have. But there is such a book as the book of Enoch. And let us not fool ourselves because the Bible talks about the book of Enoch. And the Bible, the, 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 the Apostle Jude, pulled from the book of Enoch and makes reference to what is going to happen. And in his writing, he pulled from Enoch and tells us what is going to happen. If we can turn to Jude, the book of Jude, which is the book before Revelation, because I want us to understand that when we hear these people talking and others, we don't just say, boy, they're not making sense, or yes, they're making sense, and we're not talking what is supposed to be said and so forth. I want us to understand. So, yes, we have the 66 book of the Bibles, of the Bible, and that is a fact. But there are books that 
the, our Jewish brethren makes reference to and they make reference to it in such a way that the things that they are saying that is contained in it are true in many of the instances and if they can make reference to it then we can equally make reference to it and to that extent what some of these people might say might not be incorrect so we don't just write it off but I want us to understand so the Bible tells us as the apostles were talking about the end times and what was to come the apostle Jude make reference to Enoch and I want, us to, I want us to read it together. I'm not even just going to quote it. I want us to read it together. So bring it up and let us read it together. Jude, and it has one chapter. It's just one chapter. So verse 14 now says, And Enoch also. Now this is Jude writing in his book. And Jude is just before Revelation. And here Jude makes reference to the writing of Enoch. Because Enoch himself had wrote, written a book because there is such a book called the book of Enoch and this book has given us a lot of information many of which are consistent with the Bible most of which are consistent with the Bible it speaks about things in Genesis it speaks about things that we see happening in Revelation it speaks about a lot of things that are consistent with biblical doctrine so I want us, saints of God, to know that so that when we hear this coming from other people, we don't just say they are heretic or you hear something, oh, I never know this. And what? No, we want to tell you. So there are books there. The Bible makes reference to the book of Joshua. And we will talk about it at, at another time and show us how and what these books say and the references that are made to them. And we can always outline and disclose why they can be made reference to but they are still not a part of the the book that make up the bible but the fact of the matter is saints of god the bible and in particular here the book of jude makes reference to writings in the book of enoch and so we must understand then that if reference can be made and extracted and placed in the bible by the apostle it means that there are things that we can look further at that can give us even clarity on other things make no mistake about that so i want us to be aware of that and to say oh i never knew this before well you know now we are learning we are seeing this now we're taking time and we're going through that's why it is good that we are in genesis and can cross reference and look at all the things because what is happening in enoch and in sorry in genesis with melchizedek we are seeing that melchizedek knew the same god that abraham knew as far as we are concerned everybody else are idolaters isn't that right because in the back of our minds we don't have a concept of anybody else knowing jehovah god because this is abraham now who god pull out everybody else is are, are idolaters all the nations that are around the people that are around god pull them out to take a particular people for himself and he was going to reveal himself to abraham and, and they alone going to know that this the true god exists and everybody else were idol worshippers but that was not so when abraham was having this experience with melchizedek shem was around and Shem was the godly tribe because, you understand, Shem was around, Japheth was around, Ham was around. Because they live hundreds of years down the line, so they overlap. So we need to first understand that. And remember these three, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, they were, Japheth, they were sons of Noah. And Noah was the one who found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was the one who was considered righteous. And because of that, God saved him and his sons. And Noah imparted to them all of that that was coming from before the flood. So they knew more than anybody else the things that God required, the, who God was, the way God worked with men, that it was only one God. They knew all of that. No, no, listen to what? is written here in Jude chapter 1 which is only one chapter and verse 14 and here Jude is quoting from Enoch the book of Enoch so here what he says and Enoch also the seventh from Adam 
prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So we see that Jude is quoting from him and says, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Brothers and sisters, when we quote the scripture, Jude verse 14, it wasn't Jude actually speaking those words. Because we tell you that, you, you remember that little song, John saw them coming, robed in white, because John saw the very same thing that Jude wrote about in Jude 14 and 15. Remember, John in Revelation said he saw it and he saw the Lord and sitting on a white horse and he was coming and behind him were others in white sitting on white horses coming with him. And so we sing, we sang, sing the song, you know, John saw them coming, robed in white and coming down to earth. Well, it was the same thing. Jude now was speaking about the same thing. And we were coming, the Lord with ten thousands. So it is a large number, the very thing that the Apostle John saw, the Apostle Jude was writing about. But it wasn't Jude quoting as John did. Jude was rehearsing something that he extracted from the book of Enoch. And he declared it and said, Enoch said. And it is in his writing, and this is an apostle writing. So evidently, the book of Enoch was a book. And other writings are there that show that they use that book regularly. So they had confidence in the things that are written in the book. So there's something about the book that at least we can know that even as we use it for reference, the references are true. The apostle used it. So I said all of this to come back to a point that when Abraham met upon Melchizedek and he bowed before him, you might be saying, why Abraham just bowed to the man, sir? Why Abraham, did the man tell him to bow? Or was it that his, weak, his knees got weak? Him just start paying tithes to the man, sir. What is, is it that the man requested it? Or did he instinctively know that there's something about this man? Because this man was able to tell him that the most high Jehovah was the one that gave. So the man knew the same Jehovah God that he is. So clearly, others were there that knew this God that Abraham knew. So the Bible tells us, well, I should say, the Bible tells us that Abraham bowed before him. And so the question is, why? Well, if we can go back a little bit and look in the same book of Enoch that Jude quote from, to tell us that I, he saw the Lord coming with ten thousands of his saints, and we accept it. Well, we can take a look in the same book of Enoch, and we will see that Abraham had to leave his father. From he was small, he had to leave his father's house all the time and go over to another place because he didn't grow up among his fathers. The book of Enoch said he spent so much time in another place, a little distant away from where his father was. The book of Enoch, Enoch tells us that. And that he said Abraham was always over that place because he so loved the things that he heard. From who? Guess who? From Noah. And from others. I think it was Shem. And others of his descendants. If Abraham was hearing from Noah, no wonder he had this passion and knowledge for God and wanted to know who this, more about this God, he would have learned at the feet of Abraham, of, of Noah, of Shem, and of others 
who were spiritually minded. The book of Enoch literally tells us that. This is how folks are saying, how oh, did Abraham know that God was up there? How oh, did Abraham know to just, that is not in mind telling him. How oh, did he know that he followed God and he just knew the voice of God? Clearly he knew the voice of God. How his faith came is that when the voice of God said, go, even though he didn't know where he was going, he went. That's faith. But it's not that he didn't know and have an experience with the God of heaven. He did. And because of that experience, when God said, go and go, all of them don't know where I'm going. That's faith. But he developed this over time. Because the book of Enoch tells us that he sat for long periods over at the house of Noah and Noah's sons who were alive at that time. Remember, you know, Noah lived about 600 years after the flood. You know? Most folks don't remember these things. Now, if after the flood, they lived 600 years, and within a few years after the flood, his son Shem started to have more sons, and that son having more sons. Then just imagine after 200, 300 years, and you reach down to Abraham. It's 300 more years Noah was living. So when Abraham was born, Noah was around. When Abraham was growing, Noah was around. And Shem was around. And those that Noah would have taught about the love and the grace and the power and the goodness of God, they were around. They knew everything about the flood and why the flood came because Noah was telling them. And when Abraham was absent from his house, he was around Noah's house, hearing everything about this. From our Bible, we can understand clearly that Abraham would have been contemporary in terms of the time with Shem and Noah and others. Because we see from our Bible the length of time that they lived. And we see when Abraham was born, we, see, we can see the genealogy you know, coming down to Terah, who was the son, the father of Abraham. And then Terah had Abraham and Nahor. And Nahor died and era. It's there. So it shows when Terah had Abraham and when Abraham was coming down the line. And it shows the amount of years that Noah lived after the flood. So they intersected at some point. But the Bible, our Bible didn't go into details about that. So it was telling us other things. But there was another book, which is the book of Enoch. You know, as I said, it's not a part of the 66 that we had. But if the Apostle Jude make reference to it as it relates to the coming of the Lord, then we can make reference to it to see. And as we make reference, we are seeing where Abraham was always being taught by Noah and the other godly descendants of Noah. So he was captivated with that word. And then by faith, when God spoke to him, he moved. Brothers and sisters, it's mind-boggling. But we need to understand that these are the things that are happening. So here was it now that this man Melchizedek knew the same God that Abraham knew. We would have, as I said earlier, not believed that there were people around that knew this God. But this man was able to tell him that it is the Lord that delivered you and gave the enemies into your hand. It's him give you this victory over your enemy. So he knew the Lord. And this is very significant for us to know. Now, Melchizedek, again, without father, can mean two things. Can mean him do have no father, because he was not from here. Him do have no mother, because he was not from here. Without descent, him not have any ancestors, because he was not from here. Some people believe that. But brethren, it can also mean that his father is not known. And him don't know who his mother is. Because it's possibly him coming back from a couple hundreds a year behind, almost up by the time of the flood. It could be one of the descendants of Noah. If I remember, it's hundreds of years back. They wouldn't be able to find anything about who his mother or his daddy was or his ancestry. 
because the documents could probably not be found. So it could be that. But the fact is, this was a man that God used. This was a special person. And this was a person who the Almighty would, was going to use to make reference to who was to come, who was to be a high priest, and what the purpose of a high priest was. Notice that before the law came, the high priest was there. Notice that during the law, the high priest was there. Notice that after the law is passed and gone, we still have a high priest, even today, Jesus Christ, who is after the order of Melchizedek. We will read the scriptures. But here is the point that I'm making now. The high priest was before the law. The high priest was during the law. The high priest is after the law. Point taken. Here it was that before the law came, when people were told to pay tithes so that the tithes could take care of the house and, and the priests and so forth, before all of that happened and before the law that talks about tithing, it was happening under Melchizedek. No law was there. Not never tell us to pay a tithe. Yet Abraham started tithing. So that before the law, tithing was taking place. Tithing was happening before the law. So it is not that you can say the law passed or tithing is no more. Before the law, there was tithing. During the law, there was tithing. Know that the law is passed, there is still tithing. In the same way that before the law, there is the high priest. During the law, there is the high priest. After the law, there is the high priest. So some folks might be saying, but you know, the tithing came under the law. We're no longer under the law. No, it never come under the law. Virgin tithing started before the law. And when the law is passed, it will continue to happen because it is a way of life. It is a principle. But that's not for tonight. That, that's another. That is what we're teaching on tithing. But just that you can know, because some folks kind of wonder if after the law, shouldn't we not have tithing anymore? Before the law, during the law, after the law. The high priest, before the law, during the law, after the law. So this high priest was significant. So let us read a couple more scriptures. So quickly again, just to put it back into perspective, let us turn back to Hebrew chapter 7. So we're going to read some scripture about this Melchizedek and then we're going to come to a quick conclusion and then we'll try to wrap up on Genesis tonight. All right? So let's read together again. Genesis chapter 7 verses 1 to 3. Let's put it up on the screen and we quickly run through. Yes, because I, I, I really want us to look at a couple of scriptures. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. First being by interpretation, king of righteousness. And after that also, king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. All right. So we also have, and like I said, we, we, there are two schools of thoughts on this. And I don't want to take a dogmatic position, but there are two schools of thought. This could literally be either ways because this could literally be that he's without father and without mother that means him do have no mother and do have no father in which case who is being presented here as Melchizedek is none other than God in the flesh so Melchizedek here could literally be a theophany of God God himself and he's now in the flesh so therefore he is operating in the high priestly office signifying that in the future we will have need for a high priest who was to come who would have been Jesus Christ. Notice that Jesus was a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. He was not a high priest after the order of Aaron. His 
high priestly role was higher than the Aaronic order. So although God was the one that set up the priestly order through Levi, and that was the spiritual group, those were the, the priests. If you, if you dare stretch your hand and do something what the priest is supposed to do, your hand wither. If you dare pass your place and hold up the Ark of the Covenant and you're not a, of the high priestly order and you hold it even to balance it, your goose cook. So that this was an order that was special in the eyes of Almighty God. The Levitical priesthood. And the patriarch of that was Aaron himself. God anointed him and the anointing oil ran down from his head over to his beard all the way down. And he set up the priestly order according to the instructions that he received from Almighty God. So all the priests that was going to operate to take care of the house of God had to come via this line. Jesus, however, was going to be royalty. And he came via the royal line of Judah. And yet he is the one now who is the high priest interceding for us. And he did not come via the Levitical order. How is that? But yet, the Bible said, he came under another order, which is greater than the Levitical order. He was a priest forever of the order of Melchizedek, king of Salem. So that this order, this Melchizedek, he was not just a priest for the Jewish people. He was a priest even when there was no Jews around. That means if he was whatever he was doing as a high priest of the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, it was a high priest that covered those who were around at that time. And they were, since there was no Jews, they were all one people, then he was a priest that interceded for the people of the world. That is exactly what is happening with the order that Jesus Christ is under. The Aaronic priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, was only a priesthood for the people of Israel. The Melchizedek priesthood, was a priesthood for the people of the world. And when Jesus came, that's why Jesus did not come through Levi. Otherwise, he would have just been a priest for the people of Israel, the Jews. But his priesthood is under the order of Melchizedek, which is a global priesthood. And that's why Jesus can save Jews and Greeks, bond and free, male and female because the order of his priesthood is according to that of Melchizedek and Melchizedek represents the entire world so we are seeing that coming out of the book of Genesis we are seeing a priest and God is showing us that although Exodus is going to come which is going to zero in on a particular group of people here in Genesis, I'm showing you that ultimately a priest is going to come who is going to be a high priest for the entire world. And he will be the one who makes the sacrifice. And listen, he was not... No, this is serious, you know, because this is Genesis telling us about Melchizedek who was going to be priest that covers the whole world. But what does high priest do? They make sacrifice and they are of a sacrifice now when jesus come as he did and now is the high priest for all of us do we understand that he is the high priest for the whole world and then also that he is the sacrifice for the whole world so that he is the high priest and he is the sacrifice and this high priest now take the blood so him kill himself and then resurrect himself and take the blood that he shed in the role of the sacrifice. And take the blood now as the high priest, same Jesus, and offer it to God. Who is himself in a different dimension. So that the same person who is God, is high priest and his sacrifice. 
And all of that is happening with one individual who is Jesus the Christ, who is the King of Peace and who is the King of Righteousness and therefore can do them all. But I noticed that in Genesis, Paul writing about the experience and the episode in Genesis, he's saying of Melchizedek that he is king of righteousness and that he is also king of peace and that he is a high priest of the most high God. So that somehow God was telling us in Genesis that there is a high priest that is coming. There is a high priest that is coming who was going to be doing the very thing that this great Melchizedek is doing. And this high priest we know now to be none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. So in Genesis we learn that Melchizedek was none other than a type of the real high priest that was to come. And it is very possible, saints, when we balance this thing, that Melchizedek was a theophany of God, based on what we're seeing in Hebrew chapter 7 and verse 1. Because whereas we can say they couldn't find his information about his mother, or information about his father, or information about his ancestry, equally it could say, we could say there was no information about his mother because he had no mother. There was no information about his father because he had no father. The fact is that could be very true because you could tell that Shem had a father and the information was there because his father was Noah. But you could also have information that show that Shem, because the Bible tells us that Shem had some sons and Ham had some sons and Japheth had some sons, isn't it? We spoke about it the last time. Ham had, one of Ham's sons was Cush. One of Ham's sons was Canaan. And the ancestry was there to show. How then is it that Melchizedek can be shown as a son of any one of these? Brothers and sisters, it is very possible that it cannot be shown because there was nothing to show. Because him do have no mother, him do have no father, him do have no ancestry. No descendants, either before or after, simply because it might just be that this is a theophany of God. And God coming to show himself in a high priestly role and make us understand that in the future to come, there is going to be a high priest after this order. And this is me, the high priest, and this is me, God. Because Jesus is not only the high priest, but he's the God. That the high priest offered the sacrifice too. So we are seeing, brethren, beloved, that God remains God. He became the high priest. He became the sacrifice. And you say, but well, how can God be all those things? Well, Revelation tells us that he is David's father and he is David's son. So that this Jesus is the son of the... Did you know that David had his children and out of the lineage of David, Messiah came? So he was David's son. The Bible puts it that way because he was a descendant of David. But if Jesus is father, then not only was he David's son, he had to be David's father also. So he could be the father of David and he could be the son of David. Something serious is happening here. And so in Exodus, it very well might be a theophany of God. Sitting in the seats of a high priest, showing us that a high priest is coming after this order, who is God himself and the high priest and the sacrifice. And all of this has come about in the book of Genesis for us to understand that in Genesis and this is why the attack is so much against the book of Genesis because it tells us everything yes the creation but yes redemption and this Melchizedek who is there without father without mother without descent nothing about him 
Abraham paid tithe to him. And he was able to tell Abraham exactly how you got the victory over your enemies. It came from God. He was able to tell him everything. No man, this man not normal. And he was signaling to the world that a high priest was coming. And forget about the Jewish Aaronic priesthood. This priesthood is above that. This priesthood is before that. This priesthood of Jesus Christ is after the order of Melchizedek. So Melchizedek himself, I believe, I did say there are two schools of thought, because I want to put it out there. Not going to be dogmatic on it, but it is my belief that Melchizedek was a theophany of God, and he was there to show that a time was coming when an high priest, a high priest would come after that order, and it would have been none other than Jesus Christ. And he was telling us this in the book of Genesis. I think we need to read that book. I think we need to spend some more time in that book. I think we need to get the basics of the book and build our faith and understand that it teaches us not only about things that happened then, but it pointed to a whole lot of things that would have happened down in time on this earth. And so Melchizedek was king, was high priest, was everything that Jesus Christ is today. And we learned about Jesus in terms of his high priestly role from one incident, one episode in the book of Genesis when Abraham was coming from the slaughter. I'm saying to us, brethren beloved, it looks far apart, but it is coming together. And we must understand that in this simple book, there is so much to garner, so much to learn, and so much to ponder and meditate on. And so take it that Jesus Christ, in the same way that Genesis is real and to the point and we can stand hard on it, it is the same way when we teach us about Jesus and talk about his high priestly role and his role as the sacrifice and then his role as God himself. Believe me, saints of God, it is as real as that. And you can stand up in your faith and you can be very much um, be satisfied in your mind that this is truth, that this is real, yes, and it doesn't matter what anybody say, it doesn't matter what the skeptics, the agnostics, the scientists, the, it does not matter what they put forth. These are truths that are emanating from the book, and you just throw yourself into the book, embrace the book, be lost in the book, and build your faith and trust and confidence in God. This is very important. Let's close this section quickly and we are about to close off. Let us look quickly at the other few scriptures. So here is this Melchizedek. We, we, see, we see just a small meeting. Very little is said about him. And Hebrews chapter 6, Hebrews chapter 6, then Hebrews chapter 5, then Psalm 110. Uh, let us read them quickly and then we just move on from him and we try to close off. So Hebrews um, chapter 6, verses 19 to 20. Yes, it says, Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So this is what we said earlier on, and here Paul is talking about it. He has placed so much more in terms of revealed information on Melchizedek than what we saw in Genesis. And he's saying here, and, and, and this is showing the, the, the height of Melchizedek as a high priest because Jesus was made an high priest after his order. So he has started an order which is so high that Jesus is made a high priest based on this order. Not a high priest after the Levitical order, but after the 
Melchizedek order, which is global, which is higher, and which is more powerful. And I do believe that it is as a result of who Melchizedek was, somehow a theophany of God, making it clear that this is the highest order of high priesthood, and Jesus is after this particular order. Aaron and all the others did what they had to do, but they were for a particular group, Israel, and what God had planned for them. But Jesus would have covered Israel, he would have covered everybody else, and he would have been a high priest, a global high priest, which is what and who Melchizedek was. Hebrews 5, verses 8 to 10, you know, gives us a perspective also. Though he were a son, yet learned the obedience by the things which he suffered. Talking about Jesus and me being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And so we are seeing here Melchizedek coming up each time, coming up over and over again. Psalm 110 and verse 4. And there are so many. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So this is David the psalmist now writing. So here it is now. David himself is writing about Melchizedek. It's just that he's speaking prophetically about the priest that is to come. And showing that Messiah which is to come is going to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So here it all has transpired. It all started in Genesis. But then while this is happening in Genesis, here down the line in David's time, David himself wrote about, about Melchizedek. So he knew Melchizedek in terms of understanding who he was and prophetically wrote that Messiah was going to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And this is years after Genesis. All right? And so it is important that we get that. We won't go into the other scripture because it is just, they are all just cementing what we have said before. The other one is Hebrews 7. You can just write it down. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 9. And you can go all the way down to 17. And they, they literally speak of Melchizedek. So it is important that we, we just grasp that and understand that we are covered we are basically being supervised, even at this point, by, by a high priest who is none other than the Lord Jesus. And he is in a serious, a large, and a significant role. And what we are experiencing today as a result of his priesthood was foretold from Genesis chapter number 14. And so the book of Genesis has taught us so much. The book of Genesis has illuminated so many things to us. We spent time, <coughs> sorry, we spent time and we looked at what happened on day one and day two and day three all the way down to day six of creation. Genesis gave us the history and there is a lesson behind each story we looked at what happened after creation and everything was good and then we saw the fall and we saw that there also was a story there although satan came and he tempted yes there was a story um, with that and even today those of us that have been renewed and regenerated and have received salvation, uh, we expect that we are going to walk a particular way and we are trying our best to do there. But even there, we find that from time to time we fall because of the same serpent. And we learn that even if we fall, we can get up again. Yes, every episode in Genesis everything that we have looked at that we have learned we find that there is a lesson behind it there is something for us to learn today 
And so it is important that we take time, brothers and sisters, and we go through in a timely way the book of Genesis. We, we took time and we sh showed that the book can be divided in a number of ways. We, and, and we might bring that screen up just to give us a quick synopsis because we show that chapter 1 and chapter 2, uh, you know, talks about the creation. We, throw, we show that chapter 3, and let's bring it up just for quick reference. You know, we took time and we went through giving us some of the contents of Genesis and how we can divide the book into major areas to make easier our study of the book of Genesis. If we can sectionalize it, if we can break it down and then study each section, study each uh, area, uh, then it makes that interaction with the book and interrogation of the book that much easier. And so it is, it, we have put it in a way that, you know, just looking at it, just taking our time, we are seeing that chapters 1 to 2 talks about the creation. Chapter 3 talks about the fall of man. Chapter 4, it goes into the first civilization. Chapters 5 through 9 speaks of the flood. We, when we break it down, chapter 10 and 11, the dispersion of nations, when we break it down, we kind of see how it captures them. As we take it up from chapter 12 and we go right down to chapter 50, it is talking about the patriarchs that were um, the patriarchs of the nation of Israel. It's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then, you know, between chapters 30 and 50, it speaks about Joseph. When we see those broad divisions and we start to drill into them, we do see that they, they, they tell us a story. They tell us a story. They allow for us now as we drill down to not only see the story, but to see the lessons behind the story. And this is very important. So brothers and sisters, without going through all the things in terms of review, because they are there for us. We can do the review. We can look back at them because, you know, they are saved online. Uh, but just to let us understand that the, the, we can break the book down as we do an overview and section by section we look at all that is to be looked at on. Let's do it. But understand that this book is significant. If we can or anybody can discredit the book and we follow that, we are in for great trouble. This book is the foundation on which everything else stands as it relates to the Bible and the things that are taught in and from the Bible. So we allow the book of Genesis to stand. We take it seriously. We understand the contents and the principles and the lessons that are taught in it and we embrace it and appreciate it, I absolutely guarantee, saints of God, that it will build our faith, not only in the book of Genesis, but our faith in the word of God. We will see the power of God, the awesomeness of God, and it will help us as individuals to be stronger Christians. So with that, we are going to close off on Genesis. I want us to take us back to the beginning in terms of the objectives. Let's put that back on the screen. Those four objectives, and uh, we can easily, as I close off here, just look back at those so that we can know, we can show that these objectives we would have met to survey the book, and we have done an entire survey of, from chapter 1 to 50. The breakdown that I showed just now uh, as to what happened in chapters 1 and 2 and chapter 3, and it kind of has given us an overview of the book, chapter by chapter. And so that overview gives us a, a, a clear breakdown of some of the themes in the book, you know, as I said, the themes we speak about, the creation and then the fall and then the flood and all of that, we kind of get a clearer picture. And that was one of the objectives. So that we don't see the book as a book spanning 2,500 years and it has so much. But if you can look at it and break it down chapter by chapter or merging a few chapters and you see the different themes, then we kind of start to appreciate the book a little bit more 
and we did that as one of the object, objectives. Then two, we said we wanted to use this book because by looking at the book and seeing what God did and seeing how God delivered his people and seeing the, the questions that would normally come to disprove the book and then showing that the questions can be answered from the Bible and it, it then gives us a sense that the book is really not off at all but the answers are in the book and, and other parts of the Bible and so this by answering these questions that come up from skeptics and seeing how God in general deal with the things that were happening and seeing that in the book of Genesis it spoke from the very beginning about redemption. That means that it, although it is a book of beginnings, it is also able to look into the future and talk about re, uh, salvation and redemption and so forth to that extent. Objective number two, we would have achieved because our faith would have been built or builded in the authenticity of the book. And then we look at the purpose of the book because it, it gives us an understanding that the overall Bible is one book from beginning to end. It starts off with the creation of man and a particular purpose. And it is by going through the book that we realize that it is the beginning of a series that takes us to a particular end. It is by seeing and understanding Genesis that we find that there is a purpose for the book. Because if we just started somewhere in the middle from redemption and then we work all our way until Jesus comes, we would have missed out that everything, there was a build up to what happened at Calvary and that build up started in the book of Genesis as a result of the fall of man. So we are able to fit the puzzle together having gone through the book of Genesis. Hence the purpose of the book of Genesis is highlighted and I believe we would have also done that. So objective number three would have been uh, achieved. And finally, um, we, we, we made mention of it earlier on. We wanted, as an objective, to look at the hard questions that arise as a result of going through the book of Genesis, right? The hard questions that arise uh, as a result of going through that. Yes, uh, it, it, the Bible tells us that the black race was cursed. Yes, the Bible tells us that uh, we don't see anything in the Bible about dinosaurs and all. Yes, the Bible don't have anything to say about the different races and where they came from. It had to be evolution. And brothers and sisters, we took time out and we addressed the hard questions. And we even went further to look at some amount of genetics Amen, in its simplified form, so that we could see easily that it wasn't evolution that caused people to look different in, in that sense, and that we therefore we came from a big bang in the beginning, and it therefore was not God who made us. We showed using basic genetic theory, basic, that we can expand, and as we expand, and as more persons are here, the propensity to start to look different and to have different features. And then worse when the Bible said that they were scattered abroad and they all went to different places and settled in different areas with the different climatic conditions. I mean, we were able to take on some of these questions and to express and explain why the difference in look in some places with some people etc etc we, we we took on the issue of dinosaur and the millions of years that they said that we were here and show that we didn't have to be here for millions of years for things to be as they are now if the bible said god did it in six days then it was done in six days and we don't have to try to say that it wasn't six literal years the bible said you know you could see some people try to even say that one day represented a thousand year or a million year well if it was a million year the bible said that um abraham uh adam lived for 900 and odd years then if if each of the year in creation was a million years you see and Adam was 900 years, he was living 900 and odd years, then you're basically telling me that Adam was around here for about 900 and odd million years. He's 900 million years old. No, he was just 900 years. Just like, oh God, one day is one day in creation, 
one year is one year for Adam. It didn't give us any other explanation. It's the same word that was used, and we know if he was living for 900 years, it is 900 literal years. And so the Bible said God made the heavens and the earth in six days. He could have done it in one. For his own purpose, he did it in six and rested the seventh. And it is after that that he started to tell folks to rest on the seventh day. It is, listen to me, it is straight, it is clear cut, it is as it is. The book is true and we have taken our time and we have gone through. So all the objectives that we showed, we did everything that we did and said everything that we said to fit into those objectives. And it is my prayer tonight, saints of God, that having gone through and looked at the objectives, that we would feel a little bit more confident. And I pray a lot more confident in the book itself, the book of Genesis. And so we close out on this study tonight in this book and we pick up God's willing, something new, but something to pull at our hearts, to love the word and to draw nearer to God and to live the word. God bless you as we close on this series and we pick up next week, same time, same place. Just before I pray, I just want to remind the saints of God that comes tomorrow. We meet up here at 29. Uh, so we're going to have some buses to take us down to Deanery Road. Amen for the um, convocation for Bishop uh, McGregor. Please, we are asking us to give full support. If you have to leave work a little early, I just want us to give him a full show of support and let's spend the evening and worship God together and magnify the Lord. It's going to be, as I said, at Bishop Holdsworth's assembly at um, Deanery Road and everything starts uh, at about a quarter to seven. So we want to leave, quarter to seven, seven o'clock, sorry. So we want to leave here the latest. We'll be going against the traffic. So just to give space to persons who are coming from work and want to go with the bus, come, but we want to leave here 6.30 um, and then head on there. So let's give it our full support. Our young people, our choir will be ministering. So let's come out and support them in the name of the Lord Jesus. Can we bow our heads as we pray right now. Father, we bless your great name. Mighty God, we thank you for this privilege. We thank you for this opportunity. Uh, let your name be glorified, mighty God. And use the words that we have been presenting over these last couple of weeks. Use it, Lord, to illuminate our minds and our hearts. Help us to extract as much as we can extract and to see the lessons that comes from the things that we have read, the things that we have looked at, the things that we have discussed. Lord Jesus, guide us in your word. Order our steps in your word. Help us to love you more as a result of taking time out to study your words. Have us to review and to have the words etched in our hearts so that we can live the way you want us to live. We bless your great name, mighty God. Have your own way. Let your name be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. God bless you, saints of God. And God's willing, see you in church on Sunday. In Jesus' name. Praise God.